Hello, it's Jared French with the Faith Family Bartonville Baptist, and we are in Genesis. We'll begin in Genesis chapter 1, and then be in Philippians chapter 2. If you want to open to those, uh, we'll be there in a moment. But did you know that Winston Churchill, Prime Minister Winston Churchill of England, married the U.S. of A. in the U.K.? Well, sort of. It was Sunday, August 10th, 1941. That's before the December 7th uh, Pearl Harbor attack. And it was off the coast of Newfoundland. You had the warships of the USS Augusta and the HMS Prince of Wales. And they came side by side with one another. And they had an ocean church service. And this was all Churchill's planning. So British and American seamen heard a chaplain read and preach from the KJV. They sang hymns, and Churchill wanted to show FDR and the world, in his words, that here's the same language, the same hymns, and more or less the same ideals. What he's trying to do is then bind the, uh, the two countries together to fight against evil, because there's already all these marriages, connections. So don't delay. Now, it's a heart-tugging picture uh, there, that's uh, on, on this, for us on this side of the pond. We do appreciate Churchill, I believe. <laughs> I do. Uh, we're indebted to the ideals of the Magna Carta, 1215, year 1215. That was takes place on that land over there. But you know what? Keep the Windsors. You know, the Windsors are Queen Elizabeth II, Charles, William, Harry, and all the drama that's been. All right, for decades, the U.S. of A. has been fascinated with this, these royals, and increasingly so. And why? Well, my two cent answer to get to my biblical text is there's a fa we have this fascination with the royals is because all humans are meant to have crowns or to be royals. That's why little kids find it really easy to play princess and knights, and we all we have all these different kinds of. Uh, headgear, hats, it's all that connection to, we were meant to be royals. So with that introduction, let's go to the text. And if you, starting in Genesis 1, then I'm going to move right into Philippians chapter 2. So Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, this is the reading of God's word. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock and the whole earth and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and stew it and rule over, rule the fish, the seas, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls. Now we want to move to uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And there we see that Christ Jesus, who existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of, uh, point of death, even death on the cross. And for this reason, God has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the God the Father. This is reading God's word. What did we just read? Well, this is a new series on finding Jesus, where we're going to start with an Old Testament idea and see how it points to Jesus. And so in this case, we're kind of this royal idea, this royal image. And the key idea here that I give up front is that humans were meant to wear crowns. And more specifically, believers are to wear crowns. I want to unpack that. It seems kind of like a figurative thing, but it, it has some practical merit. The first point will be on the crowning of creation from that Genesis chapter 1, 26, 28 verses. The second point will be the crowning of humanity. That's going to be from that Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. The third point would be on the crowning of believers. And that comes from a number of, kind of leads from those two points into some other verses. So with that, let me pray and we'll continue walking through God's word. Let's say, Father, I do thank you for this time to have studied your word, to consider these truths, and uh, move beyond just what we can see. 
and let it let it help us with what we can see so that our faith may be grounded upon the things you said and not just what we think we know for you have spoken in your word to help us see how we do live before an awesome God who's outside of what we know, but yet everything that we know also points to. That everything that we, we know needs rescued, and that rescuer is Jesus. And so we have a lot of things that we like, we want to, we, we pay attention to, fascinated by, but really sometimes if we follow along, the reason why we're interested in that thing is because we're really interested in you, we're interested in Jesus. And so help us to even see that with royalty uh, as we look at your, your word deeper. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So in theology, there's this concept called general revelation. And revelation sounds really fancy, but it really means just reveal. So general rev revelation is designs in life, creation, that reveal the creator. Intelligence. So Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the works of his hands. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says those designs should make us thank God. And so that's general revelation. And so have you thanked God for the shape of your head? Uh, that sounds a little funny. Maybe some of us may not like our head, but no. You know, look at your head. It's the perfect shape to put something on. When you look at all the other animals, even ones when people might say, oh, they're animals that are kind of like us. No, they're not. Right? They're, if you want to put something on their head, you have to design special straps to keep them on. And yes, we have certain things that we put straps on too, but there are a lot of things that we've designed that just naturally go on this noggin, huh? And so I, I introduced that kind of almost you know, serious, silly thing to come to the special revelation, special revealing in Scripture, Genesis chapter 1, 26-28. These verses, many have observed, it's the, it's the crowning of creation. Crowning of creation, as I called point number one. It, it, what I'm saying there is God has put this final glorious and royal touch on things. Now, let me back up to verse one of Genesis to kind of give you how that this crescendos and this becomes the, a glorious royal tux, touch. So Genesis chapter one, verse one says, In the beginning there is God. And creation really starts after that statement about God. Uh, verse 1, there's this blank canvas of the earth and the heavens. It's formless and empty, the text tells us. And from there, God starts speaking and making the formlessness, things without form, take form. So, day 1, light and day become a form. Day 2, sea and sky. Day 3, ground. And so you get those three, and then the next three days fill those things. And so the light and day from day one, day four, the sun and moon. Day five, the creatures of the sea and sky. Day six, the creatures that go on the ground. And what we notice as we walk through those, if we did read those, you'll see that God speaks. God says, and then they're, they're there, right? God says, let there be light, and there's light. God speaks things in the motion. And so what I'm getting at, so we read those verses, and then it begins, and that kind of goes kind of quickly. And then chapter 1 begins to kind of slow down a little bit there in verses 26 to 28. It almost seems like it's repeating itself, but it's not. Uh, verse 26, it's actually God speaking to God. It's kind of divine conference, a roundtable meeting. So a lot of ways, if you've been to a meeting, uh, a lot of times people take notes or minutes so that they can share it afterwards with everyone. A lot of times what you do is you list the number the people who are there. In this case, we don't get the attendees list. And so let me fill that in for you. At least I'll give my argument. That I believe that you know Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 says the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters of creation. So that seems like a, a distinct God, part of God. And then verse, you know, you have throughout this God who's speaking things in existence. So probably God the Father, I would argue. And then John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 talks about Jesus being the Word and with God in the beginning, that all things were created through Him. Colossians 1, 16 through 70 echoes John 1, but then goes on to say that Jesus holds all things together. That's not just after the cross. That's, the, that's an eternal statement, forever statement about Jesus. So I would argue that verse 26, these meeting minutes, that are from the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They were the main... Uh, people talking, uh, and this is not people, but 
God, the Godhead, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's like we're humans, they're God. One God of three persons. So, uh, like it's equivalent of humanity. You know, there are many humans in humanity. There's many God uh, persons in the Godhead. So, let us, uh, and, and what, what's, what's the meaning saying? Let us make man. And, and that's actually the same word, the word for man is the same word for ground. And so, these, well, let us make these ground dwellers in our image. And in case we begin to wonder, what, what does image mean? They, 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 they repeat themselves and use a synonym to say likeness. So, image and likeness, same thing. And so, in other words, these uh, ground dwellers are carbon copies or photocopies of some attributes of who God is. They're on us. And unlike chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 25, God gets his hands into the dirt, not just speaking. That really elevates our uniqueness. We are God's handcrafted masterpieces. Maybe sometimes we don't feel like that, but we need to appreciate that no matter who you are, this is this is uh you know this is how we're here. We are God's handcrafted masterpieces. And then God says that they're going to rule over the earth and everything in it. So from the skies to the ground, birds, fish, animals, forests, to the deserts and insects. Someone really needs to tell the mosquitoes that we rule them. Uh, but but the rule and then there's verse twenty. There's this word subdue. And what does that mean? What? Well, let me quickly say that the, the, these are the wrong verses to support things like hunting and population control. At least at this point, right? Or at this point, when we read this text, everything that has breath is super vegetarian, right? Verses 29 through 30. That's what it says there. So you could be strong like gorillas on plants, right? Isn't that amazing? You look at a gorilla, looks like he's been in the gym, a gym bro, eating tons of protein, uh, beef and such. No, the Gorillas only ever eaten vegetables, uh, uh, plant life, and they're massively strong. Well, if we could have been like that, sign me up. Unfortunately, that's something lost with Eden, that garden, paradise. But so, so there, there's there, everyone, everything's vegetarian. There's no death yet, and, and it's a perfect behavior, nearly perfect, perfect behavior going on. So no violence or cruelty. So God's basically saying, hey, let our image bearers rule. And it means that means let them be royalty. Let them have crowns and robes. And so what we're getting at is the honor God deserves from creation. He shares with us. And how do we see that? Well, you, the things that make us go marvel at the past. Pyramids, the Wall of China, developing metals, taming animals. Those are all ways that the creation bows down to us. We're not all that powerful, are we? And that's why we can go to Egypt right now and look at the pyramids. How'd they do that? Well, then look, they probably come to, if they could time travel and see what we can do with skyscrapers and, and vehicles and things. And what we're doing is we're mimicking God. Right? We're, we're taking raw forms and moving them into new forms. And the reason why we can do that is because this, this um, built in into everything in the atoms is it supposed to bow down to the image of God on us kind of mind-blowing and so you know christians should really care about creation and it's, it's rather political eyes there's theories but honestly christians should take the charge in some of this earth care stuff that that is being discussed it's because strangely creation honors us because god's royal image is on us now verses 27 through 28 the, the, the motion of the meeting you know they said okay accepted let's go do it they left the meeting and they acted and so God created man in his image, and it takes both male and female to be God's royal agents in the world. Both wear crowns. And then Genesis, Genesis chapter 2 kind of zooms in to that creation event. Um, it's kind of like a flashback in Genesis chapter 2 on how that took place. And so God's special words here speak of our designs. We were meant to be royals and have crowns. Adam and Eve were not going to run around in their birthday suits the whole time. They were designed to have robes and crowns. They really were. If only they didn't fail there in chapter 3. three. But, there, but this is the reason why we have kind of round noggins. But with that, let me move to point 2. Now there's close to 8.1 billion people on the earth. And so that's 8.1 billion royals. That would sound like a terrible idea, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's a terrible idea because it's a sinful world. Sin entered the world after the garden. 
or we're in the garden, so we're no longer in the garden. Uh, we don't know how to be royals. We really don't. We just know how to throw royal tantrums, I think. And so while our heads still might be the right size or the right shape, our hearts are not in the right shape. And that gets us in the point number two with the crowning of humanity. A special glorious touch on mankind. And what is that? I'm going to tell you up front. That glorious special touch is the Son of God becoming like us. Okay? That's what we're going to talk about. Jesus, Son of God becoming like us. Now let me back up a little bit here. Uh, there's this, as you read your Bible, if you read it from cover to cover, there's this growing expectation as uh, that covers history that um, God needs to send someone to help Adam and Eve's descendants. Genesis 3.15. God needs a someone to bless all nations in the name of Abraham. God needs to send someone to be a forever king from the tribe of Judah. God needs to send someone to sit on the throne of King David. God needs to send someone to be Isaiah's suffering servant. God needs to send someone to be Jeremiah's branch. And I could keep going on. In fact, we're going to sing a song on Sunday that kind of helps capture some of those things. But an easier way for to say all those things is to just use one word, Messiah or Christ. Messiah reflects the Hebrew, Christ reflects the Greek. If you get into the meaning of it, it means anointed one. God's anointed one. It's this idea that you anoint someone with oil and, and then send them off for a special mission. Now, it wasn't clear that this Christ figure would actually be God. <clears throat> Again, as things were unfolding. Not, and, and also, not everyone was able to keep track of what I was just reading off there, which is fair, right? But not only were they weren't able to keep track, some people knew some of the things in the Bible, but then de denied it. This is why Jesus kept telling people that he was one with God. He said that he would suffer as Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, said. So the Pharisees, one of the opponents, and even his own disciples often denied it, right? Because we know Peter, right? Oh, you know, that won't happen. You won't suffer. When, and that's when Jesus actually get behind me, Satan. So then you fast forward into the New Testament letter of Philippians chapter 2 that I read with Genesis. There it says Christ, God's anointed one, Jesus. So they put Christ first, then Jesus. And Jesus means God saves. Yahshua. Christ, Jesus, who existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. There's that likeness idea. So Philippians 2 puts who the Messiah or the Christ is, is the Son of God. And he puts it in clear text. And actually, it puts it in song. The Philippian 2, what we just read there, is actually likely an, an ancient hymn. So Paul takes a hymn that they were singing to settle a church problem. There's no problems with the churches, huh? But if only we could sing away our problems, we, we embrace the truth. But what they do, they would sing that Christ was God. John 1, uh, put in a lyrical form. Another, And so what happened here is that there was another special meeting that we don't get listed for us quite the same way as Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28. But in that meeting, they, decide, they, they asked, how are we going to save humans? And the Son, while being God, would take on the man's image, likeness. And this is kind of the, the mind-blowing stuff we're talking about here. Jesus is our, you know, the, the Son of God is already God. And so what he then does is he takes a copy of, of God and puts on to himself. He, that's how he becomes human. He's already God, but then he takes the, the form of a copy of God, right? Because that's what we are. We're the image of God. So God plus a copy of God, that equals Jesus Christ. So perfect humanity, perfect human times affinity right there. And it says he then emptied himself. So now that does not speak of, uh, that speaks of his position, right? He's no longer in heaven on a throne uh, with his father. He comes down here. It doesn't mean he empties or changes his godness. Uh, he, he puts that, he, he subjects that to his mission. He, it, it speaks of that he becomes a servant, Isaiah 53. So what this is getting at, again, this is some tall boot stuff, but you know, the pinnacle of humanity, the top bread and butter of humanity, is no longer Adam and Eve in the garden before sin. Sometimes we think that way. Well, Gen if only we could go live in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, before Genesis chapter 3 happened, before sin we cannot undo sin to get back to the garden. That's the grave power of sin. 
Rejecting God's truth for a lie over and over and over. That's sin. And lots of times we think it's good before we realize how bad it is. But now, what the, what's the top of humanity? What's the top human? It's actually, while we get that bad news, it's, it's Jesus Christ who conquered sin and death, rose to be enthroned. Right On earth, he was crowned with, with piercing thorns on earth, Matthew 27, 28, to then go riding to the crowd, clouds to receive a golden crown in heaven, Revelation 14, 14, Daniel 7. See, Jesus is, Christ is known as the second and final Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 58. He's the new standard. To the point where 2 Corinthians 4, 4 and Colossians 1, 15 has it down that Jesus is the image of God. So there's a lot here. And if this is the first time you're hearing this kind of stuff, that's okay. But what I'm getting at is from point two is Jesus is the final updated version of Genesis 1, verses 26 to 28. Right? We're not trying to get back to the garden. We're trying to get back to we're trying to get to Jesus. Now, good news is he's coming to us if we're saved. But it, you know, the point here is if we want to find our identity, you know, God, how do you see me? Uh, God, God, I want to reflect your designs. I want to use my at, my attributes correctly. Well, we have to look to Jesus to do that. We have to become like Jesus. And in fact, that's what Scripture tells us. If we are saved, God in Romans eight twenty nine says He's conforming us transforming us into the image of the Son of God, transforming it into look like Jesus. So it's always good when you can work alongside God's plans, huh? Don't want to work against them. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 says, And just as we were born in the image of the man of dust, that's the first Adam, that creation event, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. That's Jesus coming down from heaven to save us. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image. Every believer is unique. We don't want to become like another believer, but all of us believers are going to be becoming more like Jesus. That's the right direction. So I don't want to use my cookie cutter to, to you know, um, make someone else look like me. But I do want them to see the things in Jesus, that so that's something that can be true of them too. It's Jesus who we follow and become for, like. Colossians 3, 10 through 11 says, You are being renewed according to the image of your creator. In Christ there is no Greek or Jew, and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but all, or Christ is all in all. There, Again, getting to that point that I was saying there, we don't make cookie cutters to be saved in Jesus. Jesus is our, he's the cookie cutter. Um, and, uh, that's, that's hard, but, but the, the visualize, but knowing Jesus, that's how we actually grow awareness of who God is in his fullness, ourselves and our neighbors, the rest of mankind, knowing Jesus. And, and we get to know that man, Jesus is worthy of all worship. He, uh, defines everything that we should find good and powerful. And, uh, he's really want, who I want other people to get to know. Right, this is why he is the crowning of humanity. He is our way back to our royal calling, even. So that's a lot of kind of machine gun, a lot of stuff there. But the big idea is when we talk about humans, saying what, 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 how should humans be? Jesus is the picture. You want to talk about a role model? You want to talk about something more than a role model? You want to talk about cookie cutter, the standard, the pinnacle? Jesus. Okay, with that, let me move to point three. So image likeness uh, of God, it starts there in Genesis chapter 1, 26, 28, and we get that crowning event to creation. However, we lost it then, and so Jesus came to pick up and save that crown, to take over that image. And so he is the crowning to all humanity. And one day, every knee will bow in recognition of that. But the crowning is not done for us in the Bible. Those that Jesus says are to wear crowns. So the third point is on the crowning of believers. There are at least four different crowns mentioned in the New Testament. And with these crowns, we get instructions on how believers get back on the royal path. How we kind of act more royal than having royal tantrums, <laughs> you could say. Actually do the royal good things for the earth versus and, and our neighbors and ourselves. Versus being just royal rats. So... Let's get at that. The first uh, one is the crown of boasting. 
kind of those things found in 1 Thessalonians 2.19 and Philippians 4.1. Now, we always, always want to be careful what we boast in, but here's an example of where we can. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 says, for, for who is our hope, our joy, our crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord Jesus that is coming? Is it not you? Philippians 4.1 has that kind of same idea. See, with Paul, he's writing the Thessalonians, he's reminding them how important their relationship is. Uh, when we touch each other's lives in the name and power of Jesus, it makes that bond. And Jesus is proud of that. We want to do things to make Jesus proud, right? And so, in fact, Jesus wants to then crown us with that. And, and so, why that's so important, how we love one another inside the church is Jesus says the world will know his people by how they love one another. So you want to treat the faith family as Jesus wants them to be treated. You want to come alongside Jesus' plans to build up, not tear down, to help people fight sin, but not do it in a way that you, you, you're, you're just beating them up over their sin, and things like that. So um, we don't ever want to close off the church to keep a family feel. That's a temptation that I know that's out there. Um, we, but we constantly need to be reaching and remembering that Jesus has the power to increase our ability to love and have mercy and grace. So we really shortchange ourselves when we kind of think, oh, what we, we have something good here, so we just need to close the door and cap it. Uh, no, we want to keep reaching and, and seeing Jesus' family grow because Jesus wants that. And let me say one more thing about these crowns, though, is we don't get the crown by focusing on the crown. You know, like if you were... In public school, they turn you into salesmen, um, anything, sports, anything you want to play, right? If, oh, if I can sp sell enough candy bars, I'll win, I'll get the prize. We think, oh, if I can get enough people in the church building, I get the prize. No, no. We, we, what we need to do here is we focus on Jesus and then how he wants to reach others, and then he places this crown of boasting. He's the one that creates these relationships that, that we can really say, wow, you know, I may not have touched a ton of people in this life, but I've touched the ones that God wanted me to, and they've touched me in and, and the in relational building up, helping one another, supporting one another, pointing one another to God in time, rough times, praying, right? That kind of a connection, introducing them to Jesus for the first time. It doesn't. It's not about the quantity as much as quality, right? And again, we don't the focus then is on Jesus. So, <clears throat> but let this crown remind us that we need to be royal ambassadors, welcoming others to know Jesus's family, to become Jesus's family. All right. So we still have three other crowns here. I need to keep moving. So the second crown is the crown of righteousness from second Timothy four, eight. There's reserved for me. This is Paul speaking the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. So when Paul says, on that day, and those who loved his appearing, he's pointing to, when, as Jesus promised, he's going to return again. Right? Jesus ascended into heaven after being in, uh, uh, around for a little while in his resurrection, after the resurrection from the tomb. He went, then went to heaven, but he promises to return, and that's going to wrap things up as we know it. And, uh, the, but the crown of rightness or righteousness, it represents those who've made Jesus return the most defining day of our lives. That that day is the most defining day. Um, that sounds simple, but it isn't. Because normally we live either in the past or present, kind of our, our minds, how they work. We either let the past define us or define our best days. Things need to be that way or never be like that. And it kind of can keep us locked. And then the present is the, can be demanding. There's always emergencies that you're ch you feel like you're chasing your tail. Or it's really where we want to make the most of it. Uh, we only have one life, so boom, boom, boom. And so it creates a future defined by either past things, the past defines the future, or a, the future is defined by a series of present decisions with not a lot of thought about them, how they link together. Whew, that's a lot of stuff there, life, philosophy, looking at life. But, but practically what that means is lot, how most time we live life is like we're on an ocean and there's a lot of ups and down waves, right? And sometimes we just like it to be calm, but that's the time when that big old hurricane comes through. And often those ways of life are overwhelming us, right? Because we think, man, if this is how it is right now, how can I ever see a different kind of day? And it can lead to despair. 
But with this crown of righteousness, why Jesus gives us this in the text, telling us ahead of time, it reminds us that Jesus on that final day, uh, that's going to actually be the most defining thing for us. You know, and, and he wants us to wear crowns. So, yeah, today's hard. I feel like, man, the, the waves have pushed me over. This is reminding us that we need to also think through, well, you know what? My best day is yet to come. I'm going to be before Jesus one day. And, and that will be the most defining thing for me. Remember the crown of righteousness when life circumstances become defined. We feel like they're defining us versus us defining we have something better than ahead when Jesus is going to define us by crowning us. The third crown is the crown of life in James chapter 1, verse 12. Uh, in Revelation 2.10, James says, Blessed is those who endures the trial because when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who loved him. Revelation 10 kind of adds in there kind of what exactly with the trials it's, it's, it's really standing up for your faith, living your faith out, being real. And when we talk about this crown, that again, Jesus wants to give us it, the challenge is when we walk through this world, we can say, well, woe is me, I'm, I'm treated badly because of my faith. It becomes kind of a martyrdom syndrome. And guess what? No one is earning any points by telling people or God how bad things are for them. That's not being real about your faith. We feel like it is. How many people can we say? We, we earn no points for being that person on the news media complaining about how people are treating Christians badly. We get no points for the viral videos. We really don't. If our faith is real, we, we, yes, we'll go through some difficulties like this. People in other countries uh, suffer a lot for their faith in Christ. But you know what? We don't have to say a word to Jesus about this. He knows. He'll just walk over and put a crown of life on our head. Isn't that encouraging? We don't have to do the woe is me, martyrdom. Fourth thing uh, is the uh, unfading or imperishable crown in 1 Peter 5, 4 and 1 Corinthians 9, 25. Sometimes people count these as two different ones, but I would argue they're the same. It's the crown that, that we, we have in victory after a Christ. We, we do the three things I've already talked about. The Christ-like impact on others. Where we look at that and our, our greatest hope, our greatest defining moment will be when Jesus returns, when we're before Jesus. And then thirdly, that we're enduring the temptations and, and, and schemes of evil against the faith without a woe is me attitude. And really what these, this last crown really is the crown that I would say almost kind of holds up the, uh, the past ones. Uh, this is the crown to rule them all, if I could use that picture. So Jesus puts these crowns on our head, each one of these. And, and this is how believers become, 1 Peter 5, 9 says, royal priesthood. Now, it seems like I've talked about a lot of figurative stuff here, but it, but it isn't meant to be. It's supposed to be a reminder that Jesus really wants to crown you and me. Not one time, but multiple times. Multiple crowns. And we're meant to live in light of that crowning, that, that as we live like that, as we live out those values, it makes us royal today. And again, always remember Revelation 4.10 reminds us those crowns are, we have them because of Jesus in our life. We're not earning the crowns. We're just living accurately as if Jesus is who we're, we're following. And so that's why that picture in Revelation 4.10 is those crowns can be thrown at Jesus' feet because honestly, he's the one that earns them. That's how we stay humble royals. So to conclude this, hopefully, I know it's deep, but I hope maybe kind of surfacing things for you. Humans were meant to wear crowns. And believers are to wear crowns. So go be the right kind of royal. Impact others with the truth of Jesus. Look for your most defining moment is always ahead of you when Jesus returns. And so let that help be a guiding light when times get, when the seas get rough. And endure in our faith in, through the trials and temptations and schemes without a woe is me or, or viral videos on how bad things are for Christians. Be victorious, humble royals. Jesus has already conquered all and all will bow. Live like that. Let me pray. Best of Father, I do thank you for this time in your word and these truths. I know uh, it's not always easy, easy to live in light of them. I can get woe is me. I can get tunnel vision. Um, I can fail uh, the temptations, the schemes. I can get sucked into thinking that uh, I need attention, that people need to understand what I'm going through. Again, it's not wrong to, because obviously it's good for the body to know one another, uh, the faith family to know one another and, and help one another. 
But the question is, how am I doing it? Am I doing it like I'm pouting and, and making a scene, or are they really coming because they care about me and I'm someone that can be uh, cared for? And so, God, I, I do thank you for these truths that they do challenge how we live as Christians, that we wouldn't just have that name and throw it around and for things that don't matter or things that aren't going to last, but these are the things that are, that are, that are eternal, that are going to last forever, these relationships with you, and with your faith family that you create. And so I thank you for your word in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for your time. May you see more Christ in your life.